keep the momentum going. Online communities are thriving digital spaces where members interact, share, and create together. As these communities grow, so do the complexities of managing data privacy and maintaining ethical standards. The challenge lies in ensuring that while we foster vibrant, engaged environments, we also safeguard the personal information and trust of our members. This crucial balance between data privacy and ethical integrity is not just about compliance, it's actually about building a trustworthy community where members feel safe and valued. To explore these vital issues, we have an expert panel ready to share their insights and strategies. Please welcome our moderator for this discussion, Shweta Sharma, Team Lead Marketing at Vizipi Interactive. Shweta is a seasoned marketing professional with nine years of experience in the telecom and the IT services industries. So everyone, here Shweta with our next panel discussion, strategic governance and moderation in online communities. Over to you, Shweta. Thank you for the introduction, Mehek. As communities grow, there's a greater need to protect member data while also maintaining transparency and ethical standards. Striking the right balance between privacy and integrity is not just a legal obligation, but it's, but it's a must have to build trust with your members. Here's introducing today's expert panelists who will shed light on how to navigate these complex issues. First, we have Brian Oblinger. He is a strategic community consultant. Uh, with over 25 years of experience, he has been helping brands engage with their customers, increase satisfaction, lower costs, and uh, generate more revenue with the power of community. He is the founder and lead instructor of Community Strategy Academy, and he is the co-host of In Before the Log podcast. Next, um, we have Helena Medin. Helena is a senior community strategist at Coros. Uh, she spent 12 years in tech and community space while working for uh, large enterprises like Intel, Yelp, and Simplify. Um, if I'm right, she has an exciting perspective on effective moderation and custom. <laughs> Welcome to the session, um, Ryan and Helena, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, happy to be here. Sure, great to see everybody. Yeah, let's dive into this discussion. Um, Ryan, um, as we start, we would first want to understand uh, what a governance structure is and why is it so important for community pros these days? Sure. Yeah, I'll say I'll say a few things from my perspective. Um, I think that the best, you know, when we say what's a governance structure, to me, it's a value-driven approach to policy making. And when we say policies, that could be things like your community guidelines, your privacy policy, uh, your terms of service, your moderation policy, your crisis management policy, right? Like all of these different kind of documents and founding. Uh, governance that we think about when building a community are all super important. I think what you really want to do, uh, I talked about being values driven, but it, it's about setting standards um, for culture and conduct in your community and how people are expected to behave or not behave and how we might enforce, you know, various levels of that. Uh, and I, I'll just end by saying that I think the best governance structures are the ones that are much more proactive than reactive. Uh, and I think we'll we'll probably talk more on that as we go. Um, but what you don't wanna do is wait until something happens to build a governance structure or policies or codes of conduct. Um, that's a, a, a bit of a trap, I think, that, that a lot of folks fall into. So you wanna do that uh, ahead of time. Yeah, and if I can just chime in, that's a great point, Brian. Um, I think being proactive is very important, setting up that framework. A lot of times we're really excited to launch our communities and get them off the ground. And that really is the exciting piece and why we're doing this. But you've got to have that framework in place and really think about your goals ahead of time and sort of anticipate what could potentially happen. And so having that framework is really important um, before you begin the, the execution part. Okay. 
okay so um anything more that you want to share around uh, the structure of components i mean do we have any more point that we can discuss on this or we shall move to our next question which is about uh core components of good governance uh would you like to take this up helena sure sure happy to take this up uh do you want to repeat the question yeah i would like you to tell us more about the core components of good governance yeah i think there's a couple of things i mentioned earlier like framework so you want to have structure um and make it very clear and concise so that members know the expectations of what's expected of them um and you can really even when you're launching a young community setting those uh expectations ahead of time time so structure um thinking about roles and responsibilities who's going to do what and that's internal and external so we've got our community managers we've got our moderators that actually enforce these things um and then for our community members what types of permissions are they going to have you really need to think about what motivates these different types of users and what do they want to see what makes sense roles and permissions are something that you're really going to want to consider before uh or at least in the early stages of launching a community the other thing i want to talk about is tools so where i know Brian and i are going to get a little bit into tools and how there's so many useful things that you can use when you're moderating uh a community however we really don't want to underestimate uh the power of just us being humans so we can we really have the power to cultivate the environment that we want to see within a community so that means um sort of uh setting up that uh fundamental environment having your community managers actually be proactive in the types of content that they're putting out there and setting the tone so uh that sounds a little vague and a little soft but it really is uh something that a lot of people overlook and they think about these rules and these guidelines that they want to enforce but we want to make sure that these community managers actually are putting out content in the beginning stages and setting the tone almost as like an example behavior that we want to see another thing uh too that's important is escalation process so um you know moderators uh they might catch different things of the do's and don'ts so let's say somebody does uh something in a community that we don't want to see uh maybe it's um you know promotional content or spam or that sort of thing um and a user may disagree with that decision it's important to have a clear escalation process where um it goes to one person but the users actually know what to expect let's say they disagree with the decision there's a process for them to um escalate that to somebody else within the community that can make a final decision. So, I think communication uh among members uh is is super important and I've seen a lot of really good communities where this is done really well. Um you really can't have a good community without starting there. Um and sorry, go ahead Brian. I was going to give a an example, but I think I'll probably bounce off of you after this. No, I was just going to I was just going to agree with you and kind of follow up uh, with one point here, which is I think a lot of people don't necessarily know how to get started with this, right? So we can give them a list and say have this policy, have that policy, have this document. Um the good news is to your point, there's a lot of great examples and a lot of these communities are public, so you can go, you know, browse theirs and and build the best of it. I think the other point to be made though is is enlist help. And I always talk about um oftentimes we view like our legal departments as adversarial, you know, but it turns out that um they're actually trying to help us in a lot of cases and so um I'm going to I'm going to tell on you now Helena uh, for anybody who doesn't know uh Helena's like an actual real attorney so uh, our legal friends are there to help uh and review these things and they may already have inputs for things they've built for the .com for example like the privacy policy or the terms of use that can be repurposed in some way or or folded into you know what we do in the broader context with with community involved so but you know my advice would be to go cruise some sites check out their you know their policies craft your own 
and then go lean on the resources you have internally of the experts to kind of help you, uh, as I like to say, stay out of prison, you know, make sure that they're, uh, they're reviewing and approving this stuff and that it's all on the up and up. That's a great point. Yeah, and I, you know, I was a senior strategist at Intel, and one of the things that we, uh, a term that we use is business continuity, and really all that means is just being, like we said, and you'll see this as a reoccurring theme, is being proactive, and so anticipating crises before they happen, uh, working with your legal team, uh, working with, uh, you know, marketing uh, and just figuring out, you know, who internally is a stakeholder within the community um, and anticipating those things. So you're not just caught off guard and you you're responding a week later to a crisis that you could have anticipated or at least have the structure in place to uh, intercept and handle appropriately. And so um, that I think is really a core pillar of good governance. Yeah. The I'll end this one by just saying the crisis management one is the one that so many people are are deficient in. They just they haven't spent the time to dream up all of the various scenarios that could or would or might happen. And my recommendation to people is always try to think about what are the worst possible, you know, scenarios and situations. That there's examples of these. There's spam attacks. There's people threatening personal harm. You know, these kinds of things that. You definitely want to uh, sort of dream about and think about and crystallize a, a process and then practice it. Um, you know, pretend like it's happening and go through the escalation process and make sure everybody's ready to go. Hopefully, you never have to use it uh, in in the real world. But then, if you do, you've already written it and practiced it and done it, and everybody knows what their what their role is. Um, you know, you just see this time and time and time again that uh, people are trying to build their crisis response in the middle of a crisis and, you know, usually doesn't go well. Absolutely. So going back to the basics, I believe uh, crafting clear uh, rules and responsibilities, uh, expert and carefully curated policies, escalation matrix would go a long way in creating good governance. That, I mean, that's the key take takeaway as per me. So Helena, you were about to share an example. Uh, you, would you uh, like to share that? Um, I think I did when we were for question number two about core components of good governance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I talked a little bit about that business continuity at Intel. Uh, right. That's something that we kind of hold pretty right. close. Uh, what Brian said, you know, just anticipating crises before they happen. Um, you might not anticipate everything, but at least you have uh, close communication with stakeholders. Um, this doesn't just belong to community managers. That's a lot of times what people think. And they think that it belongs to moderators, community managers, and that sort of thing. But this really is the heart of a lot of organizations. And we are essentially the liaison between our users and our customers and our brand. And so it really is important to have a human approach, an empathetic approach, um, and also a swift response. So people know that you actually care and that they really are invested um, in this aspect of, of the community. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, coming back to you, Brian, uh, please tell us more about a few tools and technologies that community groups can use, uh, which can make governance easier for them. Yeah. Uh, happy to talk about tools. I do want to give a plug first uh, to something Helena said right at the top here, which is that people are still super underrated, <laughs> right? Um, specifically people with real skills as seasoned moderators or, or community managers. I think um, we'll, we'll talk about tech here in a second because it certainly plays a role and can help. But um, I know that spam management has become, you know, quite a quite a challenge for a lot of communities. I think that's only going to get worse, uh, frankly, with the way sort of generative AI is going. It's essentially free to spam your community, <laughs> so that's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, tools are important, but it turns out like people who do this for a living and are really good at it um, can get you a, a long way as well. I think, you know, luckily a lot of vendors and a lot of, you know, kind of third party technology companies have built some interesting things in terms of 
you know, spam management, filtering, um, you know, moderation tools, analytical capabilities to discover this. I think ultimately the, the first line of defense though, the first set of tools are probably the ones that are already at your disposal in most community platforms, which is sort of the administrative configuration in terms of, you know, do we have a way to set permissions such that a brand new user who just signs up today, maybe they can, you know, ask their question, but they can't post URLs or images for some period of time or until they've made five posts or something. Or, you know, we use the filters that are there to filter out certain URLs or URL structures. Some even go as far as allowing, you know, regex and, and whatnot, if you really want to get hardcore about it. So I think, you know, using the, the tools that you have at your disposal and thinking critically about, you know, how can we sort of put some roadblocks in front of people that are, uh, you know, spammers and, and those kinds of things. They're, I always tell people like they're opportunists, right? They're not, these aren't like hardened criminal masterminds or whatever. They're, they're just doing what they can do because they can. And so as soon as you put a little bit of, um, you know, roadblocks or, or things that slow them down in their way, you find that they tend to go find another easy target somewhere else. So that's sort of the, you know, automated management part. And then of course there's the, sort of moderation of content and, and users that's a little bit more nuanced than maybe like those automated systems today uh, are good at. So I think we're on this journey together, right? Of these technologies emerging. I've talked in the past about like uh, what I call bots battling bots, right? Like we have all these uh, generative AI things that are gonna be coming in our communities. The question is, how do we also use the same technology to build tools to fight them? Um, so it's kind of a funny thing to think about, but um, definitely something I think, you know, that's a, a future of communities, uh, whether we like it or not. Yeah, great, great point. Spam is such a hot topic uh, these days. I'm fairly new to Koros and uh, a lot of times, you know, that is, a full day talking about spam because it's just become so prevalent and being proactive. We've got so many great tools. Um, we've got these proactive tools that, you know, like uh, keyword searches. I think you kind of touched on that, Brian, but uh, filtering these things out or maybe having a probationary period for new users until our alg algorithm learns a little bit more about that. One of the things I think is great too is these algorithms really learn as you go. And so, it really is up to us and to also teach our members flag things if it is uh, spam, which sounds very elementary, but it really does help because it allows our algorithm to get smarter and to be able to detect these things early on. And then we've got reactive tools. So spam removals or um, filters uh, where we can kind of intercept or evaluate um, different types of questionable content that may not be uh, useful in the community. Uh, but the overarching theme, and I think you started with this, Brian, is really remembering that we're human. We have so many wonderful tools. Great. We should utilize them when we're thinking about spam and, you know, protecting our community. However, we also have people, you know, that are moderating the community and it is up to us to really use our, um, our time and our expertise to go in and one, set the example and to make sure that we're actively looking and engaging and flagging these posts because there's nothing better. We can have all the best technology in the world, but there's nothing better than having a human actually evaluate and uh, really set the tone for a community. You know, you know, Helena, you're reminding me one thing that might be interesting to just touch on here for folks is there's a difference between what works and what's easy for us, right? As as the governing organization, sometimes the prevailing thought is, well, we'll set our guidelines or, our, you know, our um, policies in such a way that make our lives easier as the people who have to run this thing or moderate it. And I understand that impulse, right? But I think what you often find is that it ends up hampering the kind of the user experience, right? So I think there's a balance between those two things. And 
like like for, as a concrete example, one that's come up recently is a lot of communities are saying, um, specifically technical communities, they're just banning all conversations related to uh, like anything produced by generative AI, right? They just have like a blanket, you can't post anything. And I get why that is, um, especially in like maybe technical support communities. Um, but at the same time, you're sort of, that's easier for us to do, right, as a blanket policy. But when you start digging into the nuance of it, it's, well, why are people using it? Maybe English isn't their first language and they're using it to translate the content, or maybe they are really using it to, you know, rebuild their thoughts in a way that is structured better, or, 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 right? I think there's a bunch of reasons why people with disabilities are gonna use these technologies to communicate and participate in these communities in ways that they haven't before. And if we simply create a blanket policy and say, you can't use any of this, um, then I think we've we've made it easier on ourselves, but we've probably like have made the user experience worse. And I also don't know how, as these things get better, you can even police that anyway, right? So probably a bigger conversation around that topic for uh, another day, but just, to illustrate a point around the balance between the two things and what ultimately is important. Absolutely. So we've covered some interesting ground here. Um, Ryan, coming back to you, uh, we have to hear a few examples of good governance done right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, <laughs> ironically, I think the best examples of governance done right are the ones you're never gonna hear about. Right, because they they've done their homework, they've built great policies, they have enforcement, they have processes running in the background, um, people doing their jobs, doing them well, you know. So I think that's the irony of of that is um, if you know about it as a user, it's probably too late, and like that's you know maybe less of a good example. So. Um, it's hard to tease out, you know, what all of those are because the good ones you don't hear about, which is interesting. Um, but I will tell you a story about one and then we'll, we'll, you know, hand off to Helena for, for something she's got. But, um, I always think about this when I sort of like a formative moment in my career or time in communities that have informed a lot of how I think about this is many, many years ago, uh, I was a community manager, moderator on a one of the biggest gaming communities in the world. And there was a new product release uh, of a OS for uh, this gaming console. And all of the kids just lost their minds, right? For like 48 hours, 72 hours. And the pace of that, uh, I think definitely put it into the, the crisis camp you know? <laughs> of just like an insane amount of gamers. Um, you know, freaking out about this software update and the features and it was bricking consoles and all kinds of mayhem was happening. Um, and that's really where I learned sort of the, the, you know, what I now espouse as best practices about having a plan, communicating in real time, trying to consolidate as much of the conversation like that into a, call it what you want, a mega thread or a stickied, you know, all conversation about that here. Um, ironically, this happened yesterday in the United States. There, there was a company uh, who had a major service outage for many hours on end. Um, I'm not gonna you know, name names, some of you know. And I went to their community and kept refreshing all day because I was really curious to see what happened. And their community was just like filling up, right? With thousands of threads and comments and posts about this outage and what's the company going to do about it and these are this was uh you know in the counter kind of a great example of how if you could have consolidated as much of that as possible into one conversation and had clear communication from someone at the company or from the moderators whatever was approved um you know instead of like letting it so it was like a real time uh thing like 24 hours ago of, of exactly what we're talking about here so i think um you know, again, be prepared, have these policies, consolidate things, have clear communication. I think if you're doing those things at a base level, like, you know, you're you're gonna be way ahead of the game. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think I read about something similar. This was back in 2022, I think, um, 
which doesn't seem that long ago, but almost three years. Um, <laughs> time is flying. So um, it was actually with uh, Slack. Slack is a great brand. Everybody uses it. We love it. Um, and they really handled, uh, it was an outage, I believe, that happened in 2022 and getting in front of these things. So having a singular place where people could come and express their grievances, their questions, and getting in front of that was really important. I think they handled that very well, rather than letting the community, because they're gonna talk about it. They're gonna talk about it. They're gonna express their grievances. You might get unwanted behavior or unwanted content. So let's be honest, let's get in front of it and let's have some transparency. I think that's what you know customers really want at the end of the day. And I think they did a brilliant job of, of handling that. So that's you know another example. Uh, Brian mentioned that you know I practice law. I've been licensed since 2009. Uh, so when I was practicing law, uh, a lot of those same principles come into the community management management world. Uh, so I think about you know potential problems that could happen. Um, a lot of times, even though I've been in the community space the last decade or so, I still have that legal hat. And so a lot of times I'm thinking about okay, well, let me ask the legal team here, like, is this okay? Or is this something that we may wanna look out in the future? I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be talking to your internal teams where everyone has a stake in the community and making sure when these crises happen that we already have a relationship with these internal teams. And so we're knowing the best plan of action and it just doesn't fall on the community manager or the moderator's shoulders. It really is a team effort and everybody has these lines of communication that are already ready to go, even if it's a crisis that we may not have anticipated. Uh, so I think um, that kind of drives home your point, Brian. I think it's just um, making sure that we are, again, our common theme is being, you know, uh, proactive rather than reactive. and. You see a lot of communities really think about this strategically before launching a community, or at least in the early phases. And usually those are typically the most uh, engaged and uh, healthy communities that I've seen so far. Yeah, I, I think the external communication part is is the biggest one here. I think a lot of companies wait until they think they have the answer to communicate. And I think the reality is that you can do a lot of good for yourself by simply letting your community know, we hear you, we understand, we don't have a solution for you yet, we'll let you know when we do, but in the meantime, we'll keep communicating whatever status we think we can communicate. Um, I think goes a long way rather than just sort of the silence and people wondering, do they even care? Do they even you know care that this is going on? So um, that's probably the biggest advice we could give anybody is, like you said, the transparent, authentic communication. Well, thank you for sharing your experience and your sustained service and inspiration for all the community process. We, I think we had a good session and uh, we have to cut this session short. We won't be able to take the question and answers, but it has been really insightful. Thank you so much for your time, Helena and Brian. It has been great interacting with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed it. Thank you, Brian, Helena, and Shweta for this panel discussion. I'm sure the audience couldn't have asked for a better panel discussion than this. Mm -hmm.